right, let's take our Bibles. We're going to be in Galatians chapter number two. Did anybody not get the handout? A what? There's a shade on it right now. Is it still shining through? Well, you only have to worry about it for another month, and then. <laughs> Can you hand those out? Can you raise your hand if you didn't get a, one of those handouts? If you're fine to see it right now, just don't sit in the sun, Shine. You'll be. We could all go over on the other side. We could. It's up to you. You. It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> Is it easier for everybody to move on the other side? <laughs> yeah. If you don't like it, move. <laughs> All right. The wisdom that's all in there. Yes. I'll divide the child in half and give you <laughs> half. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's turn to Galatians chapter number two. If you find your place there, let's stand. And we're going to read ten verses there in Galatians chapter number two. Paul is continuing here with his testimony. And tonight he's going to talk about the approval of the brethren in Jerusalem. And so Galatians 2, verse number 1 says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But Neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But... Of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And uh, let's go, to the Lord, in prayer. Ask His help on the words study tonight. So let's uh, let's pray, and ask God's blessing. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you just for the opportunity to be here tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the great privilege it is to seek your face in prayer. And Lord, we thank you just for the promises of the church getting together and praying. And uh, Lord, we thank you that we uh, have put our hands on a few things and agreed in prayer. And Lord, we'll trust you to get the glory and the outcome. And Lord, we pray tonight for the Word of God. We pray that you would just open up our minds and our hearts' understanding of it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see our place in Scripture, help us to see the importance of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that you would help us just to truly to rest our souls in, uh, in the Holy Word of God tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so uh, it's been said about Galatians, Galatians is the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. Martin Luther, who um, on his way home one night, I got caught in a thunderstorm and swore his life away to St. Anne that he'd become a monk uh, and became an Augustinian monk and had suffered great things and was very, very zealous uh, in being a monk and fastings and prayer and took a, took a pilgrimage to Rome and uh, a lot of different prayer journeys there, uh, praying up the steps that were suppo supposedly 
uh, walked up by Christ or moved to Rome on his knees praying there. Um, finally, through studying the Word of God, Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. He realized that he was saved not by his works because uh, he, he realized this God that he was trying to please. He actually says, deep down in my heart, I hated him because he was never satisfied in anything that I did for him. Uh, and there's just no way that he could ever have peace in his soul. He could not do uh, enough. And he realized that, um, that uh, what he was looking for had already been done on the cross. Uh, and that as he placed faith in, in Christ, that he would receive the justification that his heart so longed for. Uh, all his sins would be washed away and the righteousness that he sought uh, would be Christ's righteousness placed upon his own account. Uh, and so it's a wonderful day. He was born again, saved in the family of God. Uh, he writes commentary on Romans later on. John Wesley would go through the same type of a thing. You know, John Wesley was part of the Holiness Club, uh, and uh, he was uh, at Oxford, and an another person in the Holiness Club was George Whitfield, neither of whom, you know, Charles Wesley, John Wesley, George Whitfield, none of these men were saved, but they were a member of the Holiness Club. Uh, fastings and prayer, they'd bring uh, communion in uh, to prisons and visit prisoners, which were really, uh, prisons were awful places to visit back then. Uh, they do works for the poor. Uh, John Wesley came to America, came to Georgia to convert uh, the Native Americans. And, uh, and, you know, so he's a missionary, pastor of a church, and then on his way home to England, uh, there was a great storm at sea, and there was a group that uh, we would tie association with, the Moravians, who uh, were a Baptistic group, very much like us, uh, that realized that this is salvation through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, so there was a great storm out on the sea, and these Moravians were, during the storm, everybody thought that they were probably going to go down with the ship in the midst of the ocean. Uh, they were singing praises uh, unto God and just praising God in the midst of the sea. And he realized that this group uh, had a peace that he himself did not have. Back in England, uh, he goes to one of their meetings and they are reading a commentary by Martin Luther uh, in one of their services about the just living by faith. Uh, and uh, through Martin Luther's commentary on Romans 1.17. Uh, John Wesley, who is part of the Great Awakening in America, really part of our foundation, uh, was born again by grace through faith. George Whitfield would later come on to this understanding. Uh, and so both of, these, both of these men or anybody who has labored underneath the burden of the law, uh, which says do, 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 and you could never do enough to to have your own righteousness or have your own satisfaction of salvation came to a saving faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and were saved by faith. And after their conversion, were able to do amazing things for God. A lot of people are worried that, you know, if you, you know, you Baptists think once saved, always saved. I Amen, mean, brother. you know, um, then I mean, I can just say a prayer and live however you want. Yeah, you can, but if you really got saved, uh, you wouldn't want to live. Amen, Your right. desire would fundamentally and radically change from the inside out. You'd be a new creature created Amen, Amen. afresh in Christ Jesus, and now you'd be serving Christ out of love and not out of fear. Because before, when you're underneath the law, uh, you're underneath fear because you're, never, you're worried about never being able to do enough. Uh, and Paul's going to go on to tell us that, that uh, through grace, we actually live not in accordance with the law, but we actually live above the law. Uh, meaning this, we don't break the law, we fulfill the law and go above and beyond the law's demands. Uh, and we do this all by a supernatural power that is given to us by the Holy Spirit, this agent of grace uh, that Christ actually takes up resident inside of you and I, uh, and he lives through us, uh, and we're able to do amazing things through us. So back to Martin Luther, Martin Luther loved Galatians. He said, that is my epistle. I am a spouse to it. It is my wife. He said, this is my declaration of liberty, this book of Galatians. Uh, this is where I live. And this is exactly where the Apostle Paul lived as well. 
and he gives us his own testimony in accordance to it. So he was zealous, you see, in chapter number one, uh, more than all of his peers. I mean, he, he, served, uh, uh, he served in this legalistic realm. Uh, he was a Pharisee, the Pharisee, the ruler of the Jews. Uh, so whatever you can do, I can do better. And he was zealous, uh, and he persecuted the people of God. He said he did it ignorantly and in unbelief. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of unsaved people who practice wickedness, uh, we need to, to give them a break. Remember Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive them. Why? They know not what they, they, know do. Not what they do. And that was the Apostle Paul before he got saved. Uh, and then once he got saved, remember, he's, he's, in a, he's in a train and he's going 100 miles an hour the opposite direction. And remember that salvation is of the Lord. It's a supernatural miracle. Now, the seeds of the gospel have already been sown. He's heard Christians plea. He's pleaded, he's the prosecuting attorney against Christians, uh, and so he's condemning them uh, in the court of law. You know, he's hailing them into prison. Uh, he was most likely at Stephen's death. He was the, the prosecutor there when Stephen was stoned to death. He heard the amazing sermon of Stephen. He knew all about what Christians believed. Uh, and how many, how many had to be witnessed to more than one time before you got saved? How many of you say you heard the gospel maybe a hundred times? Raise your hand. I probably heard a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred. I don't know how many thousands of times I heard the gospel. I, but the night I got saved, something supernatural happened. The Holy Ghost showed up and uh, what was up here was transferred down to here and something changed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. All things passed away. Behold, all things become new. So you're born again into a new relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and you finish the way that you start. Uh, so he's going to say, that which has begun in the spirit, is it going to be finished in the flesh? I don't think so. He says, whatever is begun in the spirit has to be finished in the spirit. Uh, and so when you got saved, Christ put his eternal life in you. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall sometimes perish. Is that what it says? Uh, and I always like to ask people, how long does eternal life last for? When was the war of 1812? Um, for, forever. And so there's this supernatural gift of the Spirit, and it says that in the flesh, uh, and we're going we're to trace this just a little bit, uh, that there would be fleshly people who would spy out. They privily come in. They're spies. Spies don't have a declaration on them saying, I am a spy. Um, wolves in sheep's clothing. A wolf in sheep's clothing, they disguise themselves as a sheep, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Um, so understand this. From the Apostle Paul's testimony to others, there's unregenerated people who dwell in the midst of regenerated people who are after the flesh. I think, you know, the Bible says deceiving and being deceived. Yeah. Do you know that if you tell a lie, you think that, well, I know it's a lie you know what after a while you won't that's the danger is that you end up deceiving your very own self uh and so there's people who are deceivers and being deceived and so these these uh these spies come in they privily spy out the liberty that you have in christ remember he says i am surprised that you are so soon removed from him him uh, and so they were going from serving christ out of love I know it's an amazing thing, you know, amazing reality. You know, I'm, you know, everything in God's providence. I, you know, I'm so thankful that I got saved when I did. That was all part of God's plan. And so it doesn't matter if you got saved at, you know, 65 years old. I believe, I think I can show you from the Bible, that let's say you got saved at 65. All my life was wasted. I say, you know what? You got saved the exact moment and hour that you were supposed to get saved. Uh, and, and Christ uh, gave the parable of the day laborers. Remember, some got hired at the beginning. <laughs> some got saved when they were six years old and lived their whole life for Jesus. Some got saved like the thief on the cross at the very end. Mm -hmm. And then remember at the end of the day, and the guys who were working all day long said, hey, that's not fair. He says, wait, did you not agree with me <laughs> for a day's, a day's labor? Yeah, that's that's right. what you received as a day's labor. And then the people who were called at the end also got the, you know, so... You know, you rest in Christ on the day that you got saved. Um, but I'm thankful that I got to live in Christianity for a while without Christ under the law. You know, before you get saved, you're married to a list of rules. You're married to the law, 
before you die to the law. And then you're, when, that, when, when you die to the law, it talks about in Romans, then you're married to a person, that person's Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, under the law, you know, if you ask somebody, anybody, um, do you try to be a good person? You could ask somebody on death row, do you try to be a good person? Well, I do try. And you know what they're trying to do? Is they're trying to keep a list of rules. And so Paul, the Pharisee, the Pharisee, a ruler, he's, he's living according to a list of rules. Uh, and he says, I'm doing it better than anybody else. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not the, the rules of God. It's the traditions of men that he's living in accordance to. Uh, but once he meets Christ, now he says, I am a man, an apostle after Christ. Christ saved me. And Christ called me into this calling. And now what I do, I do for the Lord. And I don't do it, he says in chapter number one, to please men. I do it to please the Lord. So everything that I do, I'm trying to do uh, for the glory of Christ, not the glory of self. I'm trying to do it just out of love for God. And I'm not trying to do it to keep a, uh, a stack of good things over here. Now, my dad, you know, said to me, he grew up in Lutheran church. I'm sure much to the chagrin of Martin Luther, uh, you know, he said that he was taught by a Sunday school teacher that there's a scale in heaven. You know, your good works put on one side and your bad works put on another side. And, you know, if your good outweighs your bad, welcome on in. And um, I'm not going to look at the verses, but... Um, you know, if you're, if you're saved by being a good person, you don't have to thank Jesus one iota when you get to heaven, man. You earned it. You deserve to pat yourself on the back. Let's all applaud you. You earned your way to heaven. Way to go, right? Uh, and so uh, here's the temptation of these people that are going to try to spy out this liberty. And so it says in verse number one, then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem. Remember, he went up to Jerusalem. He says, I saw Peter. I saw the Lord's brother. Uh, and he says, they really didn't add anything to me. Meaning they, already conf they just confirmed what I already knew. And so, you know, one Lord, one faith, you know, one baptism. They confirmed what I already knew. They added nothing to me. But then after 14 years of ministry, I went back up to, into Jerusalem. Uh, in verse number two, he says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run, um, I should run or had run in vain, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So, look at your notes. Paul went up to Jerusalem, he says, by revelation. God wanted him to go up to Jerusalem. So revelation there is your blank. God sent Paul to Jerusalem to receive confirmation of the gospel from the brethren in the Jerusalem church. The pillars of the church extended to Paul the right hand of fellowship. I'll we'll read here in a minute in verse number 9. Affirming Paul that he had not run in vain. He said, and you know, the apostle Paul knew, and I, I know he was confident. He wasn't out there for 14 years. I'm hoping I'm preaching the right gospel here. I'm hoping these Gentiles don't really need to be uh, circumcised. And then after 14 years, he has some doubts, and he's going to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, no, the Lord said, go up to Jerusalem and confirm just for the Gentiles' sake, for the ministry's sake, for the book of Galatians' sake, for Acts 15's sake, uh, confirm that these Gentiles uh, and all that you're preaching is the one true faith. Uh, and it, you know, the Bible says, in a multitude of counselors, there, there is safety. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be accomplished. And so Paul, remember the one born out of due season, there's 12 apostles in Jerusalem, uh, and he doesn't meet with all of them. Um, James, the apostle James, not the Lord's brother James, has already been put to death, but he goes and he meets, to, meets with these men who are in the school of Christ. They were all with Christ, for three years, uh, being trained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they were appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word. He's going to go up there and he's going to confirm what he's been preaching with these men uh, just so he can go back with an epistle, with a letter to these Gentiles saying, see here, 
You do not need to add works to your salvation. This is what these apostles have been saying. Uh, and remember, we looked on it's Sunday, and this is important for us to remember, that we, there wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't second class Christians. The first class Christians in the first century weren't the ones who got to see Jesus face to face. Well, sister so-and-so, she's so holy because, I mean, she saw Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I imagine if I saw Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount, I would be as holy and righteous as sister so-and-so. Uh, <laughs> Ernie says, had Jesus sign her, her Bible. Wouldn't yep. that be awesome? <laughs> and, uh, and so Peter says, we were with Christ on the Holy Mount, 2 Peter chapter number 1. We heard a voice from heaven. So I heard God the Father. We saw Jesus in all of his glory. But then he says, but ye have a more sure word of prophecy. He says, you're actually at a bigger advantage than we were seeing a vision up on the Holy Mount. You have the actual word of God. Amen. And so the Amen. word of God was the meeting place. And so when he goes and meets with these apostles, they're confirming and they're all meeting together uh, at the Word of God. And remember, anything that we do in church, this is the meeting place. This is the mind of Christ. Uh, I remember uh, Clarence Sexton was saying when he was pastoring in um, New Jersey, right outside of New York City. It starts with a P. I can't think of the name of the town. Patterson. Patterson, New Jersey, right outside of New York City. Uh, so he taking over the church, made some changes and things and he says that you know some people didn't like it and they were leaving and he says there was a big coup and he said he said I took my Bible and he says I I put it on the floor and he says I, I knelt down on the Bible in front of these men. He says, men, if you would meet with me right here. And he says, you know the he said they end up with a prayer meeting. He says, you know, that church turned a corner. God bless that church. And he says, they decided that the meeting place was going to be at the word of God. So Paul meets up there in Jerusalem and has this conference. We're going to look at that conference. Look, if you will, to Acts chapter number 15. So Acts chapter number 15, and this is a famous chapter here in your Bibles, and this is what is known as the Jerusalem Conference. The Jerusalem Conference. Um, So Acts chapter number 15, and look at, um, look at verse number 27. Of, you know what? Look at chapter 14, verse number 27. It says, And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. Here's Paul and Barnabas, and they're at the church at Antioch. They went on their, first, they went on their missionary journey. They're coming back, uh, and they're... Um, sent out of the authority of the church in Antioch. They're coming back to report to the church in Antioch. And it says, And they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Chapter 15, verse number 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses... Ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Uh, so they're contending for the faith. They're contending over the matter of um, adding works to salvation. Remember, remember Jude challenges uh, that, that we should earnestly contend for the faith? Uh, and he says, uh, when I thought it needful to write to you of the common salvation, uh, it was needful that I write unto you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Some people would say there, you see, Jude wanted to write about the common salvation, but then instead he changed his mind yep. and said that earnestly contend for the faith. And here's the, here's the point that I think that Jude is making there. He says, if you don't earnestly contend for the faith, you lose the common salvation. 
So remember these, this church in Galatia, these Galatians are saved, but they're straying into legalism. And Paul said, that salvation is going to be absolutely lost. You know, the saved people can apostatize back into some sort of a works-based um, merit system with God. I do X, Y, and Z. I got all these boxes here that I check, and therefore I am a little bit above and a little bit more in favor and underneath the grace of God. I have earned the grace of God. I'm a different tier Christian than you are. And this, this, is, uh, this is a legalistic mindset. And so these people come in and says, oh, you've been saved, you're, gent you're Gentiles. Well, you're going to have to be Jews and you're going to have to keep this ceremonial law uh, if you want to keep that salvation of yours. If you want to keep in favor with God, uh, here's what you're going to need to do. And so the decision was made, go up to Jerusalem and see what the apostles in Jerusalem have to say regarding this. So verse number 3 of Acts 15. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. There's joy. There's going to be joy in Jerusalem over the Gentiles getting saved. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees. Now, in the Bible, is the Pharisees a good group? Now, if you read historically um, through the intertestamental period, you have this Reformation that takes place under Judas, Judas Maccabeus. Yeah. You know, Catholics, Catholic friends uh, will tell you all about the Maccabees. But uh, you, they're a historical um, group of people, and Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, uh, and he has this, uh, he, he casts off the shackles of the, the Greek rule there and reestablishes temple worship. And then the sect arises probably out of some good cause, and there's probably good people that founded the Pharisaical sect, uh, but Pharisaism had to do with purity. But by the time that Christ rolled around, they teached, uh, they, they teached, <laughs> they taught uh, the doctrines of men for commandments of God. Yeah. So they obfuscated the law of God by adding to it, and people couldn't even see the Bible. You know, every time I talk to a, a Mormon, I ask him this, and every time the answer is yes, uh, I'll, I'll ask a Mormon, do you read the Bible? Yes. Most of the time they'll say, I read it every day. A good Mormon reads the Bible every day. But you know, they don't, they don't come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know the reason why? Because something has been added to the Bible. Um, I was watching an ep episode of Ben Shapiro, it's, it's a Sunday afternoon interview, and he was interviewing John MacArthur. A very interesting interview. Yep. So it's the last 15 minutes. Um, but uh, because John MacArthur just preaches to him the gospel for 15 minutes straight. Um, but one of the things that Ben Shapiro says, he says, well, I don't study the Bible directly. There's other experts uh, that understand the Bible better than I do, and I read what they have to say about the Bible. And so he says, essentially, this is exactly what Jesus was fighting against through the Gospels. He says, you have heard it been said, but I say unto you, uh, because they were, they were, uh, the Bible was being blocked by these people who were adding traditions and laws and rules and regulations of their fathers to the Bible, and they couldn't even see the Bible for what it is because of their uh, traditions. Uh, and so remember that Jesus said, to his disciples, um, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, that was the top of the list, and the leaven of the Sadducees, he says another place, and the leaven of Herod. Now, the leaven of the Pharisees is legalism, adding works to grace. The leaven of the Sadducees is liberalism. The leaven of Herod is the leaven of worldliness. So he's talking to his disciples. He says, disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember that the scathing rebukes of Christ were reserved for those who were morally self-righteous. In fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount is this. 
here, here's the key verse. If you read any scholar, they will tell you the key verse is this in the Sermon on the Mount, the great uh, Christian manifesto, is this. Accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And they're thinking, what? They're the most righteous, holy people. I mean, you should see the rules that they keep. I mean, they wash the, the, all the utensils this way, and they only take a certain amount of steps on uh, the Sabbath, and uh, they're always faithful to synagogue. And man, you should hear the money chingle when they put it in the offering plate. And I can't imagine ever being more righteous than a Pharisee. Uh, and what Christ is saying is you're going to have to get your righteousness from a different place other than yeah, yourself. Amen, you have to get your righteousness from me. Right. I am the source of righteousness. Uh, and so it says there again, look at it. Verse 5. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now look at, um, look at verse number 19. Peter stands up, affirms the gospel. James here makes this epistle. And it's, it's an epistle contained here in the book of Acts. And they're going to take this short epistle from James, uh, who was the pastor there at the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem. And he's going to write the letter, and they're going to take it with them, and they're going to be able to show the Gentiles that, hey, listen, even the saints, all the apostles who are trained by Christ, they affirm that you do not need to add anything to your salvation, no ceremonial law. And so here, here is... Um, Here's the edict, verse number 19. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they should abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Um, now, you have, you have the ceremonial aspects of the law. James says nothing. They don't have to keep anything there. He says, the more, here's what he's saying, especially abstain from fornication. The moral aspects of the law, like thou shalt not kill, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou sh you know, fornication, they are supposed to uphold the moral aspects of the law. You're obeying them out of love. Uh, and so this weight of the law that our fathers were burdened down with, that's disregarded. Uh, and then the, the funny thing is about uh, meat sacrifice to idols. Paul later on, this is, the, this is the, um, the principle of weaker conscience. He says, well, if your conscience doesn't condemn you, he says, the idol is nothing. And so if you want some good discount meat, you know, meat that's been dedicated to some phony god, um, you know, sneak down there. But if it causes your brother to offend, he says, you can't defile your brother's conscience. And so here's, and I'm going to show you this principle here in a minute. Um, so... Let's say, you know, sister so-and-so believes that it is very ungodly to wear lipstick. Well, Paul says, you know, if I'm a woman, I'm, you know, go to sister so-and-so's house, I'm not going to wear any lipstick. But if, you know, if the church comes up with an edict saying that this is the edict of the church, that women from this time forward shall never, in accordance with God's law, wear lipstick, Paul says, I'm going to take that lipstick and I'm going to smear it on everybody's lips who comes into church. Is it because they're trying, they're trying to make a, a law out of something that is not a law, but it is a tradition uh, that played out in their mind. And we could go a hundred different directions with this, couldn't we? Uh, and so, uh, so look at verse 20 again. For we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses from old time hath uh, in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surname uh, uh, Bar Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and the elders and the brethren, sending them greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Assyria and Cilicia. And it goes on. You can read this all on your own time. So look at the approval of circumcision. Here, we're almost done. 
Not really, but I'm going to skip a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> the, approval, the approval about circumcision. So we see, he says, I, I went to Jerusalem, and all the apostles there, all the high mucky mucks, that's what he essentially says, the pillars, he calls them, those seeming to be somewhat. Uh, and I love how he puts that. He respects them, and also he says in Galatians there, I met with them privately, so he didn't make this a public matter. He met with them privately first, and they had some sort of council meeting. Someone was kind enough to capture it on film there for you in the picture. Uh, and here's Paul in front of the apostles and, and making his appeal. Uh, and so they, they make this edict, they make this declaration there, the approval about circumcision. Here's the testimony of Titus. Look at there in your notes. Here's the testimony. I'm not circumcised, but I am every bit saved, contrary to what is being taught by the Judaizers. Then there's a the testimony of Timothy. If you're, if you're still in Acts, look at chapter 16. So there's this big ordeal about circumcision, Acts 15. Okay? I mean, Paul makes this journey, Barnabas with him. They come back with this, these epistles, these letters, affirming their certification that Gentiles, good news, good news. You don't have to be circumcised, here you go. Uh, and so I've been preaching it, and here's some... Here's the brethren, here's the counsel of the brethren. We determine according to God's word that there is no need for circumcision. And you know what Paul does in Acts chapter number 16 with Timothy? Circumcises him. So let's look at that. Look at Acts chapter number 16. Here, I'll tell us why. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren, which were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took him and circumcised him. Notice what? Because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. It didn't say because God demanded it. Uh, it didn't say because it was required of Jews. Uh, and here I have the verse in there, 1 Corinthians 9.20. And unto the Jews, I became a Jew. Uh, and we're going to see later on in, in um, chapter number 2 in Galatians that Peter, you know, he's eating hot dogs with the Gentiles. Yeah. Jews were not, you know, circum, circumcision, if you read about it, uh, so there, there was this, this separation, um, showing the separation of the flesh. It's kind of a, a picture of a ded dedication coming apart from your flesh unto God. Also is a separation of the people. Uh, it's like David down in the, the valley and everybody's scared of uh, Goliath and, uh, and he's defying the most high God and everybody's uh, shaking and trembling. And, uh, and so here's, here's how they talk about Gentiles. You know, us Gentile dogs. Um, how long will this uncircumcised Philistine defy the Most High God? So there was a separation of Israel from the world and then also symbolically from the flesh unto Jehovah God. Uh, and it was a picture here uh, of what was going on. And so Paul said that we did this because of the Jews. In 1 Corinthians 9.20, and under the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So here's the testimony of Timothy. There in your notes. Paul took and circumcised Timothy to avoid offending the Jews. It would render Timothy's labors more acceptable to the Jews. Paul follows this principle of the weaker brother. And so remember those who are tied up in holy days and holy things and holy this and holy that. He says, to one day, if you esteem it above another, it's good for you. To another, no. Um, it's funny how things seep into our tradition. We used to, like here, every Christmas have a Christmas service. Until the first year I was here, I'm like, I do not feel like doing a service. It will not be Christmas for me if I had to put on a Christmas service. And so, <laughs> everybody, except Evelyn Baker, I really feel bad for 
Carolyn. She was devastated. I don't, I don't know what to do for Christmas. It's like, do you think Calvary has a service? I like, I don't know. Call them up and see if they have a service there. And they didn't, you know. Uh, and so she was, but you know, kind of got out of her. So now it's not tradition anymore. But I got good news for Evelyn. This year, we are going to have a Sunday Christmas service. You know why? Yes, exactly why. <laughs> Uh, and so I'll see you this Sunday. Uh, and so here's a conclusion on, on circumcision. The Jews and the Gentiles are saved uh, in the same manner. There's some references there. And we're going to see it again. Uh, the matter, he's going to talk about circumcision again and again in the book of Galatians. Paul did not give place, he says, to this for even an hour. And there was approval of the conviction, approval of the calling. Let's look back at our text. I'll say a few things about it, uh, and then we'll be done. So back in Galatians chapter number 2. Okay. So we left off uh, verse number 3. Let's read down to verse number 10, and then we'll wind her down. So they're up in Jerusalem, verse number 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. Paul said, not for one moment would I give place to some sort of um, legalistic faction coming in. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Remember, um, good news about denominations that um, believe you can lose your salvation. The good news is, for those who are saved, they can't lose their salvation even if they believe they can. That's the good news. Yes, uh, the bad news is, is if they're preaching some sort of work salvation, their kids think that they earn favor. They need to believe in Christ and this or and that. It's not all about Christ. It's about doing to maintain favor with God. Uh, and so he says, he says that the gospel might continue with you. I didn't put up with it for an hour. Verse number six. He says, but these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's persons. <laughs> Remember, the, tr the truth is level, okay? We meet right at the scripture. Remember, Paul said, though if I or an angel from heaven come to you preaching another gospel, he says, let them be accursed. That means right. let them go to hell. Amen. That's what is exactly what it means. He says, so even an angel came down from heaven and preached something different. He says, you know, um, anathema. You know, he says, gone. And so, but these who seem to be somewhat, whatever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's persons, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles." And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, that same which I also was forward to do. Let's read the notes here, and we'll finish. So the approval of the conviction. The pillars in the church approved them. They seemingly somewhat people uh, were Peter, James, and John. They were in the school of Christ. They spent three years with God in the flesh. Paul showed honor and respect to these men, but at the same time, he held to scriptural truth. Uh, the word of God was the ultimate meeting place of all these men. We learned God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't give one person a corner on the truth. Peter says, uh, no scripture is given of any private interpretation. So it's a public interpretation um, in common to all. So no church, denomination, or single person has a corner on the interpretation of scripture. Uh, to be a scripture-taught man is the same as being in the school 
of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. If you're a student of the Bible, you're in the school of Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, the teacher in you, and you have the Holy Spirit written book. Uh, this is the mark of every Bible-based ministry. There will all be similarities in doctrine. Uh, so it's amazing. You can travel overseas. You can go to uh, the other side of the world and where they take credence to the Word of God and historically, literally, um, take Scripture at face value. You'll find out that you are on the same page. Now, we're all human. We all see through a glass darkly. So some, there might be a little variation interpretation over here and over there. But ultimately, all in all, we're on the same page, which is a comforting thing. Then yep. um, there's approval of his calling. So that's your blank there, calling. Uh, they recognize Paul's call to the Gentiles. They recognize the calling of God upon Paul's life. The church did not call Paul, but identified God's call. There's a principle in the Bible, too. Acts 13, Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Paul. Uh, for the work whereunto I have called them. Uh, this is what happens in ordination. They recognize that Peter and Paul had the same Holy Spirit, but they were called to minister the gospel to two different people groups. Peter's going to the Jews, Paul's going to the Gentiles. They recognize each other as brethren who helped the saints in a coordinated effort. It says they extended them the right hand of fellowship. So you're in a meeting, I'm going to extend to brother so-and-so the right hand of fellowship. That's where they get that from, Galatians, right there. In Jerusalem, we see what priority of all the Christians should be. Truth, they meant it, truth. Then there's friendship, that's partnership. And they're working together for world evangelism. And I stole those three things from Clarence Sexton. That's like the center of his ministry. Truth, friendship, and world evangelism. I heard that 10,000 times going through college. And so... I paid for it, so that's why I used it. And, uh, and so he says, don't forget the poor saints. He says, Paul says, let's do it together. Let's meet at the truth. We'll be friends of the truth. And let's get something done for God together. Truth, friendship, and world evangelism. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the precious word of God. Amen. And without Amen. it, we would be lost, helpless, and hopeless without a light in this world. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. Thank you for what we've heard. We thank you for the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. He set us free. And we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you just for uh, the free grace of Christ, both to be saved and to live the Christian life. And Lord, help us to live in grace. Let's help us to live according to the Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. We want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.